So, um, as I said before, welcome to my talk, Actions Speak Louder Than Words. Um, I'm going to speak about the need of, for us to do better by our communities and how we can do that. So I'm going to give some practical tips and uh, hopefully, you know, this will help us kind of all become better members and leaders of our communities. So I'm just going to start to talk a little bit about myself. My name is, ooh, my name is Leon, apologies. Um, I'm a developer advocate with Loft Labs. We build developer tooling for Kubernetes and um, I create some all kinds of content, mainly videos, um, talks, obviously. And uh, I also host a podcast. It's called League of Extraordinary Tech Workers. I published a total of one episode so far. So maybe wait a couple of weeks before you check it out. But um, the podcast is about people's super superpowers. You know, every everyone who works at tech probably has at least one superpower. And um, yeah, my guests and I, we, we talk about this. And so it's super fun. It's supposed to be super fun. If you're interested, then um, talk to me later. Yeah, uh, I'm also speaking a lot, uh, as you know, since you're here listening to me talk. And um, I organize a couple of community events or communities. Among them are uh, Kubaroki. So I'm the chief karaoke officer of Kubaroki, which is the first and only Kubernetes karaoke community. And um, I'm also helping to organize DevOps Days Amsterdam. And I um, started the Serverless Days Amsterdam chapter. So I'm based out of Amsterdam, in case you didn't make that connection. Um, so yeah, I, I want to start this talk talking a little bit about my journey and how I got here where I am right now. Um, so after school, I always wanted to kind of save the world, make the world a better place. So I decided to go to law school. And I did that for three years and somehow found myself to be uh, kind of bored by the job. I'm still very interested in the subject matter, but um, just the work of preparing memos all day just didn't seem very thrilling. So I started to think back to the last time I kind of enjoyed something that could maybe become a career. And when I was 12, I used to build websites, um, HTML, really basic stuff, and um, stealing some JavaScript snippets from the internet. Because this was the 90s, it was the Wild West, everything, was, everything goes, or so we thought. And I thought, this could actually be a good job, why not? So I um, did an apprenticeship in Germany, became a web developer, and um, I think I was a pretty adequate web developer. Like I'm capable of learning things. If I need to pick something up, I, I will do it. I, um, I will learn it. But I was never just super passionate about any like specific technology or specific uh, programming paradigm or anything like that. And um, one day I joined a user group event. So this was back in a uh, web world. So this was like, I think an a PHP user group. And uh, I absolutely hated it. Um, so I was sitting there with some members of the audience and they were like heckling the speaker with really like uncomfortable remarks. Like they were yelling, oh, take it off. And ironically, the speaker was male and the hecklers were female. And um, from what I could gather is that they all knew each other. They were like friends, you know, they were very comfortable with each other. But um, for me as an outsider, for me, as someone who went to their very first tech event, it just felt really terrible. It felt terrifying and I just was not comfortable at all. So I stayed very far away from tech events after that and I just thought like networking is super useless. You know, like you're here to write code. What are you gonna talk to people about? Um, but a couple of years later, I gave it another shot and um, I was working for a company where uh, some of the folks were organizing an um, event called JS Unconference. And um, these were people that I trusted very much. So I thought, let's give it another shot. And uh, the unconference format is basically, you attend the conference and you pitch your talk right there on stage and then the audience gets to vote. So you already get a lot of feedback on like, you know, the people around you and you get a chance to take that feedback and propose it again on the second day, which was great. And that experience was so entirely different from the first time. Um, I gave my first talk there. The support was so overwhelming and amazing. Um, and yeah, it was just a great experience. And this was the first time that I finally felt that I have a space in tech. Like me personally, the person that I am and you know, all the skills that I have is actually, there's a, there's a space for me and my skills are actually needed. And that feeling is so important to me and was so life-changing that 
right now I'm just doing everything that I can to give other people the same kind of feeling because I think this was like, it can really make or break your entire career. And uh, I personally am focused on folks who are marginalized or underrepresented but just because I believe they are most deserving of my attention. Um, nothing against white guys, it's just that I think you get other resources somewhere else. So um, yeah, I've been working in tech for a bit over a decade now. I've been speaking at conferences since um, I don't know, 2016 or something. I've organized all kinds of events, conferences, meetups, socials, and been involved in um, the sponsor side, the organizer sides, the attendee sides, the speaker sides. And of course, I'm a, uh, I'm a member of an underrepresented group myself. So yeah, all that I'm sharing with you today are from my personal experiences, um, both working and you know attending events, and um, also opinions from me being like a professional, but also uh, from a personal, more personal view. So let's talk about communities first, because communities can serve a lot of functions, and they can be a safe space for people to share their experiences. They can also expose us to new ideas and new people. But sometimes these goals run opposite, uh, opposed to each other, right? Like if you invite new people, then there's always this kind of aspect that, you know, it might make other people unsafe, or you just don't have this like group of people who know exactly how to talk to each other. So it is on the community leaders to set the rules of engagement. And often we don't realize how even the smallest things can be life-changing opportunities. So I do organize a lot of after-conference dinners, you know, like 10 people coming together, 20 people coming together. And when I do that, I'm creating a microcosm of community and of platform. So I'm basically creating connections between my and other folks' networks. And um, this could be maybe the igniting spark for someone's career. So what I do is, when I do these di dinners, I always try to invite some folks that I know, some friends, you know, but also some new people that I just met that day. Because I think it's that kind of like synergy that really makes these events um, special. Um, and also, you know, if I know the CTO of whatever this company, and then there's someone who's just starting their career and they just happen to sit next to each other, that will give this person access to the industry in a way that they just couldn't regularly get. Um, and yeah, I, I know exactly how life-changing this can be at the beginning of your career because this is exactly what happened to me. And I still think for, you know, even though I'm further down, along in my career, I still think that these are, um, that these are putting me at an advantage, you know, having these um, dinners or social events. And sometimes also people ask me how they can become part of a community, um, which is very interesting because in my opinion, simply by showing up to meetups, to webinars, to Twitter spaces, or maybe to a conference like this and sitting in the audience, um, you are already part of the community. And every time you take up space, if you, you know, um, have an opinion that you want to share or you're asking a question, you are, in my opinion, a community leader because People might not necessarily agree with you, but if you speak up, it doesn't mean that your words don't have weight because someone else probably had the exact same thought. Someone else for sure had the exact same question. So you are taking up space, not just for yourself, but also for other people in the community that you represent. Um, yeah, I, again, I really cannot stress how important community has been for my career, but also for my well-being, for my sense of belonging. And yeah, this is why I'm so passionate about making these experiences um, that the folks are having with communities the best ones that they possibly can have. So um, I think people are very complicated, and, um, but a lot of things are complicated. For example, having principles and values and acting on them is complicated. Because anyone who has ever done any free labor for the community knows that I mean, if you're like maintaining an open source project or hosting or organizing a community event, you barely have enough time to just do the basic stuff that you need to do, right? Because it's often not even your day job. Um, let alone take the extra effort to make sure that it's diverse and inclusive and safe. Totally understand it's a labor of love and community leaders and organizers deserve our respect for that. And while it's important that we hold each other accountable when someone does some, something wrong, it's also important we cut each other some slack. Um, I've seen a lot of you know, people going to Twitter complaining about something. That's totally valid to complain about, 
but there needs to be room to make mistakes and to make amends for them. We're talking a lot about public learning, but public learning is meaningless if we can't publicly fail. Right? If you fail publicly and your career is over, then that's not public learning at all. So if you have an issue with something or someone, ideally, if you can, voice your, um, voice your um, concerns directly to the responsible people and give them a chance to rectify their mistake before you blast them on social media. Because if we think about this as a community, then this should not be an adversarial situation. It should be an opportunity for everyone, including yourself, including myself, to learn and grow um, because, and, and this is like a little bit of a, of a tired phrase now, but we are all in this together. So the thing is that committing yourself to DNI does not come naturally to most of us. It is hard work that requires intentional action. And we have to confront our own biases and shortcomings if we really want to create a place for everyone. Um, so community needs to be actively built if we want to do it right. Sometimes community just happens, you know, but what, often what I see is that in these types of communities, they do favor the most privileged, the ones who are the, you know, the most assertive, the loudest, because if we are, if DNI would just happen by itself, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have this entire track, right? So clearly we need to do a bit more than just thinking, oh, but I, I'm such a tolerant person. So um, I'm really interested in power dynamics and how folks get hurt in communities or by communities. And since I've started digging into this, I've often sat with a lot of discomfort about my, myself and my own actions. Um, so for example, I've started following disability act advocates and they constantly call out behavior that I was or still am guilty of because we live in an ableist society. And even though I'm doing things that are well intended, because I don't have the context and don't have the context of someone else's lived experience, I sometimes don't realize that what I'm doing is actually harming them. So when you find that out, when someone calls you out and tells you, you know, the thing that you're doing is actually hurting me and you're, you're saying that you want to be my ally, but what, what you're in fact doing is hurting me, that is very painful to hear. And yes, my first instinct is often just ignore it or be go on the defensive or even be offended and go to the counter uh, attack. Um, but I've learned that, you know, this is obviously not the best way to handle it. Um, it's more important to learn to sit with the, to get comfortable with the discomfort, to just sit and think, be curious. Like, why do you think this way? Is there something that I'm missing? Maybe there's like systems or um, institutions in place that are invisible to me because they don't target me. Um, but if I had another identity, I would have that experience as well. So really, um, DNI, and I, in, in my opinion, or being an ally, in my opinion, always requires you to listen more than to say. <clears throat> so the other thing is, at the beginning, um, all this work is really hard, and it requires that to be done on top of the already demanding work that you already have to do as a community leader. But over time, it will get more easier. The more you do it, it will become second nature to you. So when we started Serverless Days Amsterdam, at our first conferences, uh, at our first conference, we had three or four proposals from women out of a total of 70. And obviously that was quite devastating for us, but what we got from that when we talked about it later was that we just didn't invest enough into the community first. So what we did was we started to run meetups and made sure to regularly invite women and people of color to speak at those meetups. And the more we invited, the more other folks who are marginalized would then reach out to us and say like, hey, my friend spoke at your event and I'm very interested as well. So it becomes easier over time. And um, one of my proudest moments actually was when we put on a um, meetup and while it was on, then we realized we had an all female speaker lineup and all female hosts. And we didn't realize it because we didn't, we were not looking for it. We weren't trying to make it happen. It just kind of happened because the community to the outside seemed like a very welcoming one. So that's what I'm saying. The more you do it, the easier it will get. So um, yeah, I was once invited to speak at a Women in Tech event. And um, I, what I usually do when I'm getting invited to conferences or really any kind of conferences that I'm interested in speaking is I will check the lineup. I will check the organizing um, team just to see what kind of people are making, calling the shots here. What kind of people do they want to attend these events? 
um, you know, like how aware are they of things like gender imbalance or um, racial imbalance. So uh, after I checked the lineup, I realized that about 50% of the speakers were men, which is quite interesting for a women in tech event. So I asked the organizer about this and she said it was because she didn't see a lot of male attendance in the event and in an effort to make the audience more diverse, she thought, you know what, I learned that representation matters, so I'm just gonna make half the speakers men. And I don't know if she could see the irony of that, but I sure did. So um, I made it clear to her that I will not speak at an event for women, highlighting women's perspectives and struggles that would be featuring 50% men. It just doesn't make any sense. And what she said was very eye-opening to me because she basically complained that, you know, she's just trying to make everyone happy, but it's very hard. And I think that was the mistake. Like, you shouldn't try to make everyone happy. You should commit yourself to your core mission, your North Star, and by that you can um, make decisions transparently and decisively. So if your mission is giving women, women a voice, showcasing women's issues and struggles, then it's quite clear that 50% men is probably not gonna deliver that message, probably not. So um, I think in that case, it would have helped her to, to understand you know, what actually makes sense instead of trying to just make everyone happy on a whim. So if you're running a community event or if you're leading a community, like an open source community, ask yourself, what are your core values? What distinguishes your community maybe from other communities? And what can your audience or your uh, community members expect from this community? Um, so there's a lot of great stuff I learned from folks out there. And one of the people that I will mention throughout this talk a lot is Kim Creighton. Yes. Because, uh, yeah, she's only made me and a lot of people out there aware of the systems and institutions of oppressions, but also teaches us how to be strategic about things. So this is one of her quotes, intention without strategy is uh, chaos, um, which really speaks to me a lot because we can have all the very best intentions and plaster them on our websites and have like, you know, like rainbow logo stuff, but they are worthless completely without an actual strategy how to achieve those goals and how to use your energy and your resources to then really focus on tangible goals. So when you have your core values set up, you need to think about the strategy next. Um, as an example, do you want, a, you want a diverse speaker lineup, for example? How will you achieve that? Because if you're just like crossing, cross your fingers, that's clearly not enough. Maybe you reach out to folks from marginalized communities to apply to your CFP. What if you don't get enough uh, diverse candidates for your CF CFP? What is your contingency plan? Do you have people that you can invite? Um, don't forget your own biases when you're going through a blind CFP. Because we're all humans and we grew up in this world and we will all have our own biases. And I think it's better to recognize them, understand them, counteract them, than trying to remove all the personalized information from an application, like an interview or something, um, and then hope that this will be completely unbiased. Um, which will almost certainly not be the case. Um, it's kind of like, you know, when people say, I don't see color, which they, they often say that with good intentions. But when you say you don't see color, it means you're also blind to the oppression out there. You're blind to like the struggles that people have to get where they are right now, which you're basically silencing them and silencing their, their um, experiences and stories. It's just not, um, not getting you closer to what the goal actually is, what I think the goal is. So um, the more you think about these things in advance, the more you have in place to increase the likelihood of having diverse speakers. And that means the less stress you need to be when the CFP closes and when you have a lot of other things lined up. It's all about setting yourself up to, for success. You're never gonna get like the perfect solution that 100% will be completely fair to everyone, but you can do small things that will all get you closer to your goal. Because when it comes down to it, a diverse speaker lineup is dependent on a diverse community. And um, that needs to be one in which marginalized people can feel safe to express their viewpoint, even or especially when they go against the majority viewpoints. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of communities that seem to fall short in that regard. Um, specifically, I'm talking about conferences and CFPs because there have been some issues recently um, if you are familiar with the Kubernetes space, 
there is a community event called KCD, community, uh, Kubernetes Community Days, and they've been having some issues um, getting women to speak. So there were a couple that had all male speaker lineups. And um, the problem is that then the next step is, oh, now we're going to specifically invite women, which already kind of looks bad because it plays into the trope that women can only speak if they're invited to speak, right? And um, the other thing is that now you're putting the burden on the shoulders of the people who are already marginalized, and it's not their problem. They didn't cause the problem. It's the majority of privileged, mostly white folks who caused it, and then you know, they put it onto the, oh, you're a woman of color, so clearly you know all the solutions and you are responsible now to, to implement them. Um, and then also this leads to the other problem that now you're putting one of the probably celebrity tokens into a space that could have also been given to someone who has not been on stage before. Maybe doesn't get the chance to travel a lot and speak a lot. Maybe has a completely different perspective on things because they're new to this space. So again, you're inviting someone thinking this will increase diversity, but they're not really diverse in that sense because they are already in the space and taking up space in this community. So this leads me to this quote by Jamila Jamil, who um, is an actress you might know from um, playing Tahani in The Good Place. She has some problematic issues, but this quote I think was really um, speaking to me a lot because she was talking about how the media frame the emergence of a new star in a specific niche. She was talking because she's, um, I think she's like uh, Pakistani or from, um, from the Indian subcontinent, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but she was talking about, you know, like a new um, actress who was kind of like, had the same um, background and then people would write in the news, oh, move aside Jamila Jamil, like it's time for a new blah, blah, blah. And she would say that, no, I'm not going to move aside, just stand next to me and we can be here together. So we should like always make new space instead of taking space away from other people. You know, I don't want to be the only woman in the room. If I can avoid it, I, I just don't want to do it. So the key here is to create more opportunities for underrepresented folks. You already have two female speakers or chairs or executives. Doesn't mean that your work is done now. Can you get even more underrepresented folks into your roster? How about a female um, who is disabled? You know, like there's a lot of, a lot of variety out there. It doesn't mean that I tick this box, so I'm done now. What about first time speakers? What about someone who's not in your tech circle? If you have a Kubernetes conference, maybe find a designer to speak on the intersection of design and infrastructure. Like the whole point to go into conferences is to broaden your horizon. If you have a highlight, uh, if you want to highlight a topic, but you only know male um, speakers or you only know men who, who um, are knowledgeable about it, ask this guy if they can introduce you to an underrepresented person in their network who can speak on the topic. So this is another important quote from Tim. Um, and so far, I've only been talking about diversity, which is about reaching out um, out of your comfort zone, welcoming people to your group. But inclusion is where the real sweet spot is, because that is about keeping them in your communities, which means creating psychological safety, giving them a space to express themselves where they feel heard, understood, and needed. So many times when people ask, why is there not more diversity in this space? The problem is actually not diversity, quite the opposite. It's because the only efforts have been made to, um, towards getting people into the space, but very little towards inclusion and like keeping people in the space. So this is something that I, I'm doing for my events and my communities. This is like a framework that I've kind of developed for myself, the ABC of inclusion. And if you have any feedback for me, anything, any ways that I can make, to make it better, uh, anything to add, please absolutely talk to me. I would love to hear it. So the A in this case is accessibility. Is your event, is your venue, is your community accessible? And that just doesn't mean, you know, like ramps for people who need mobility aids. Is your event safe for women? Do they have to go walk through a big unlit parking lot? How difficult is it for me to get there if I don't have a car? or a bike. How about folks who have children? Can they bring their kids? Can they join remotely? Is your event at a time of day that is only convenient for anyone who's single and in their mid-20s? Is it affordable? Is it free? Is there a language barrier? There's a lot of these things that all fund our accessibility. And once again, if you start thinking like, okay, there's an event there and 
this, is, this works fine for me. This is my first thought. And then my next thought is, what if it wasn't fine for me? What if I didn't like this thing? What if I didn't like Star Wars? How, what are alternatives that I could offer to people who are just not the mainstream? So the next thing is B, which stands for behavior, and that's about the general vibe of the community. What kind of people are present and vocal? How are people behaving? Because if you're a person who's been marginalized and overlooked and mistreated in the past, you've learned to pick up cues from the most minute details, microaggressions. Uh, you will learn about these indicators um, and they will tell you what kind of community you can expect. Um, I once heard this quote, culture is everything that management allows. And it obviously lacks a bit of nuance, but then I think the core is really hits the nail on the head because as community leaders, once again, we set the tone. Sometimes it's very overt and sometimes it's subtle. But um, if you, you will notice immediately, are folks vigilant about the language they are using? Are community leaders um, cognizant to avoid gendered language, ableist slurs, or using mental illnesses to describe bad behavior? Um, are you know, your organizer sponsors using sexualized imagery? Are they using sexually loaded language? Like virgin or I'll be gentle, that's the worst, I think. Um, are people gatekeeping? Are they talking about real programming languages or real geeks? These kinds of things. Um, please be mindful to tone it down if you are uh, with the inside jokes and being overly familiar if you are in a group of people who do not belong to your normal close groups. So again, this is the, goes back to the uh, experience that I had at the very beginning that I talked to you about. Um, sometimes it's, something is okay for your in-group, but you risk that the language might be offensive to other people or it's just boring to them, right? They just feel completely excluded. The, the hurdle for them to join your group and to feel as part of the community is so much higher now, and it's just not necessary, right? Just be welcoming. If someone new joins your table, change the subject, right? You've often been talking about, you know, the last time you met and then someone new joins. Just, you know, welcome the new person, make an explicit effort to welcome them and then change the subject. All of these things are not, do not rise to something that would violate a code of conduct but they're all subtle indicators of how much you are thinking about people who are outsiders and how much you care about them. So what about the behavior that will cross the line? Ideally, when you are um, already creating this atmosphere of vigilance, you don't have to deal with this so much because the members of your community will help you police behavior, but it's always better to be safe than sorry. So usually you will have a code of conduct, most communities do. Do you have staff to enforce it? This is the most important thing. Um, remember also that a COC is not there to mediate a disagreement between equals. It's there to protect the most vulnerable. So when in doubt, always prioritize the needs and safety of those who are most vulnerable. Because it's not about punishing bad behavior. It's about the safety and comfort of everyone else. If you're shooting for more diversity at your events, that will come at the cost of the folks who be behave in an exclusive manner. And again, it's not about punishing them. It's not about teaching them a lesson. Just tell them, I'm sorry, but the community that I'm creating here is just cannot deal with your behavior. Once you're willing to change that, you are more than welcome to join. Until then, I'm sorry, you have to you know, go somewhere else. So I was um, part of the Global COC team for an event called Global Diversity CFB Day. Um, this is a one-day workshop where all over the world, volunteers will run workshops to help marginalized folks create their first public presentation. And um, yeah, I was on the global COC team with Kim. Uh, that's when I learned so much from her. And in this group, we were acutely aware that our attendees would be largely from marginalized um, groups. So we wanted to be extra cautious and vigilant. So what we were doing, uh, what we were doing was that every workshop runner had to take part in a um, COC training. And we came up with scenarios for people to go through, examples of violations and how we would suggest for them to handle them. Um, but th those were just suggestions. So you can check them out there. It's a 10 minute video and like a Google doc. So I'm gonna summarize the most important points in that, uh, from that workshop, just so you don't have to watch it if you don't want to. So the first thing is make the COC visible. Hang posters throughout your uh, venue. Um, that just reinforces the idea that, you know, you really care about the COC and um, to make sure that people are aware that you have one and what the rules are. Also clarify the consequences of violations as much as you can while also giving you some space to maneuver. You don't have to be like very strict on that. 
But just so people know, possible consequences include you know, you're getting kicked out of the event, maybe you'll get, get banned from uh, future events or um, you know, uh, social media, whatever. Um, just make it clear that you list all the possibilities. Um, reporting incidents should be as straightforward as possible, and uh, the more channels you offer for reporting incidents, the more likely it will be that people will report to you. Also put that with the COC. Ideally, um, if you have a COC uh, team, um, you can also introduce them. You can also say, like, this person wearing this shirt, you can go to them. Um, it's also, I think, personally, very important that these COC team members are just doing that, and they don't have any other um, responsibilities because they might be competing at some point. And you know, th just to make sure that they're always available, make sure that they don't have anything else to do. When you get a report, um, focus on the reporter, right? Like, if you have you know doubts about what happened, whatever, you can always talk to this, talk about this with your team members after the report. But while you're getting it, make sure the reporter feels safe, they feel believed, they feel listened to. Ask clarifying questions if you have them, but in the moment, this is all about getting the story from the reporter. And if you can, be as transparent as you can to the outside. So what we would do is we would have a log, a COC log, where we would where we publish there was a, a report and this is what we did. It was kind of vague because we wanted to you know, make sure that people are uh, still, um, to, to keep people's privacy, but we still wanted to just let people know that, hey, things happened and we took action. This is the action we took. And then finally, this is the most important thing for me about community is understanding that it's not about you. Because if something hinges on a single person, it doesn't scale and it doesn't grow. If you want to do big things, you need to take care of the small things. You need to make things accessible, not just for your attendees or your members, um, but also for your organization team. Because then that frees you up to do other things, touch other communities, and scale up your influence. And eventually, those small things that you, that you put out to the world, they will all come back to you. People will you know, give back to you. And by then, you will have inspired so many people that the, the, the eventual result of it is bigger and better than you alone could have ever achieved or dreamed of. Um, when I started with Serverless Days Amsterdam, and even before that, I was like, very active with all kinds of community work. But I tried to, I, I was actually also in uh, politics for a while. Um, and I tried for years to march on by myself. I had this vision of the perfect world. And I, it felt terrible because I was tilting at windmills. I felt like I d didn't belong. No one's really helping me. And it was just so much and totally over overwhelming. But when I started to trust in the community and really just serve the community and let go of everything else, um, that's when I really found the sweet spot. Like instead of just trying to like focus on or like follow that grand vision that I had, every step and every decision I would just try to make the best possible decision in that moment. Because the community is bigger than you yourself, so you can't let your own ambitions and visions be in the way of achieving that. So yeah, um, I mentioned Kim Craig throughout this talk. She's been educating and supporting marginalized folks for such a long time, and I've learned so much from her. So I want to shout out um, her book, Profit, Profit Without Oppression. If you want to go deeper into this topic, if you're willing to sit with your own you know, discomfort, look at your own behavior first, um, then yeah, check out this book for sure. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope this was really helpful. Come to me for some corporately mandated diversity stickers or uh, for the um, Kubero Key Community stickers. Thank you so much. I don't know if we have time for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Wait, I need to give you the mic. There you go. Hello? OK. Hi, yes. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, can I find any of your stuff online? I would like to figure that, like, see what you've got and just be able to try to follow it myself. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you can follow me on the internet. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. <laughs> um, you can follow me at Leon Makes Things. So that's my handle on Twitter, uh, Blue Sky. Oh, I have, 
I have a blue sky invite that I will give out to preferably a black woman or a person of an underrepresented group. So if you're interested, please come by. And um, yeah, so Lian makes things or Lian makes things that deaf. That's where I also, uh, that's my website also, and I can share some other like talks or whatever I'm doing in that space is probably all there. And what was the podcast you're doing? The podcast is called League of Extraordinary Tech Workers, and I'm working on the second episode right now. So um, yeah, again, just reach out to me. I would be so happy to talk to all of you. The whole idea of that podcast is also to not just speak to engineers, but to speak to everyone who works in tech, like also you know, office managers, everyone who takes part in you know, the industry. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. <laughs> anyone else? Yeah, no, thank you for, for the talk. Oh my God, it's so weird to hear my voice. <laughs> um, thanks for the talk. I, I think there's a, so part of the work that I do is working with students. And one of the things that we do is working about like, why do, should they care about like inclusion and diversity, mm -hmm. right? And uh, one of the things that we noticed was that it got to a point that it was kind of like people were just doing the inclusion and diversity talk just to talk about inclusion and diversity, but not really being very intentional about it. Mm -hmm. And an assessment that we started to work with students about was understanding or doing an assessment about your context. And what I mean by that is that different regions and different countries will have different underprivileged or underserved mm -hmm. communities. Yeah. And I think if we're really thinking of making an intentional effort to build diverse communities, the first thing is understand what's in your context so that you can really find beyond just like following the trend on inclusion and diversity, really making an impact on your local community. And yeah. hopefully that will guide your efforts. Um, different countries have different like yeah. contexts. Yeah. And I don't know, that making students think beyond just like create a kind of code of post it and people will report there, really being like, hey, who are some of these people that might feel like they're not being served currently in your right. in your community. Uh, that really can like change the approach, and is something that I th I think a lot of community builders are appreciating a lot. Yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly also the point that I was trying to make with, um, you know, you invite the famous people who are non-binary or black or you know whatever the box is that you're trying to take, and then that's not diversity. And I think that's really. Even understanding, as you say, like, why do I want diversity? Is it just because it, look, it will look better on my branding material? No, it's because the more diverse opinions you have, the, the better or the higher the chances are that you ha are making the best decision, right? It's a pretty straightforward concept. I think at this point in time, if you don't see the economic advantages for diversity, I don't know what to tell you. Like, it's, it's right there. Um, but yeah, I think that understanding also as you say, in your cultural context, you know, like maybe there is an aspect that is just not what you would think of if you just like think in these kinds of boxes. Um, I would be very interested to hear like what, what kind of tools you have in your toolbox and we can talk about this later. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I'm going to popcorn the microphone. <laughs> um. Uh, yeah, thank you for your talk. Thanks. I am new to tech. Actually, I've been in for about a year, and so I'm I do community for the Decentralized Identity Foundation. Okay. And the challenge here with diversity in the space I'm in is that people just don't know about it. But the interesting thing is market research is showing that this sector will grow, can grow by 89% by 2030. So there's this huge opportunity but I see all these groups unaware. Yeah. And I, so me and some people in the community were holding a hackathon on June 5th to invite people to learn about this technology from beginner to advanced level. And so I guess I'm, my ask here in the room to you and to people in the room is help me find those channels of unrepresented people that I can tell us about tell about this event and tell about this um, this space to invite to my community because I feel like that's just not being done right yeah, now. Yeah. Um, there are some groups out there. There's like Women in Cloud Native, Women Who Code, and these groups exist. But I think you, as someone who's creating community, um, you need to really think about if if I was on social media and I just see someone posting about, hey, join our event if you are 
woman or something, would you just do this? I would only do it if I know someone who I trust who's in that group or if this group has already proven to me that they are doing these things and not just talking about it. So I think in those cases, it's really, we are, we owe it to these marginalized folks first to prove that they can trust us before we just say like, oh, just come to us. But like go to those groups that already exist first and ask them and then also ask for feedback. Like what would you need to come to my event? What are you missing? So that's what I, how I would start. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes. Hi there. Hi. Thank you for your talk. My name's Autumn. It's very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. you said something that resonated with me uh, quite a bit you, when you talked about um, marginalized folks being like tasked with solving a problem because mm -hmm. this happens to me very often, yes. right? So, oh, Autumn, you're a black woman. Yeah. Um, tell us how to fix the issues. Right. With black women or black and people if you at had our the company. Experience of every single marginalized person out exactly, there. Exactly, yeah. exactly. You now speak for every black person yeah. because you're the only one here. Exactly. Um, what are what's some good advice that you have of, um, de, you know, declining this offer, saying, you know what, I'm not mm. comfortable doing that because I've declined, but then I become, you know, stamped with the oh, she's not a cooperator or mm. she's aggressive or she's upset or she, we offended her some way. So now we're just not gonna talk to her about anything right. ever again. <laughs> that is a biggie. Um, I mean, if I, had a, if I had just an answer to that, I would probably make a lot of money with yes. consulting for that. <laughs> um, I think what I'm doing, so first, if you're able to find some allies just you know, just amongst yourself, just your friends. And especially, obviously, if you can find some white men who will speak up for you, that would be ideal. Kind of sucks that you have to rely on that, but that's unfortunately how it is. So this is what I usually do. I will find some people who I know understand to some degree the issue, mm -hmm. and I will just ask them to be aware. Like if, if in a meeting someone's just asking you to take notes again, maybe they can speak up for you like, hey, um, sorry, what was it, Anita? Autumn. Uh, Autumn, like sorry. The season, no worries. It's always taking notes. Maybe someone else could do it instead, or maybe I'm doing it instead, you know? Like, that's, I found to be most effective because in these smaller groups, in like a corporate setting, if you start calling people out for their obvious like racism or sexism, it won't end well. Mm -hmm. So it's more useful to just talk to individual people and try to make the problem first appear to be individual and then once you get a bit more buy-in and people start noticing, oh, right, that is actually what's happening all the time, then you can start maybe talking about, you know, what well, this is actually a systemic issue. And once, you know, because if people need to first see the small, see that it exists at all mm -hmm. before they're willing to see, oh, now I see it's actually all around me. And that's, and that's how it was for me, for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't... I didn't buy into all of this when I started in tech because it's like really discouraged to talk about these systemic issues and it's like, no, focus on your code. Don't talk about women or something. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Questions? Thank you. Thanks so much for your talk. I Thank felt you. like I really resonated with that. I'm actually here because um, Women Who Code, which is an organization that you mentioned, they yeah. actually um, I won tickets to come here. Um, I'm a student. I like did a complete career change and I'm trying to get into this world of tech. And in an ideal world, I would love to like work for a company who like cares about diversity and inclusion, has a female CEO, all of that. But I also feel like it's realistically like really difficult. And I'm also kind of like stuck in the battle between like, you know, taking like opportunities I can get, which might not be like, you know, like culturally ideal yeah. for me. I'm just wondering if you have any advice for someone who's like trying to break into the industry, um, what to kind of prioritize. I've worked for previous, I was in like banking and financing before, mm -hmm. or uh, sorry, mortgages before, and I just didn't like it. I didn't like the culture. I didn't like how the companies were set up, but I feel like it's always a battle for us because it's just never like an ideal situation. Yeah. So yeah, I yeah. don't know if you have any advice for someone who's like trying to get into the industry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, yeah. So. First, having a female CEO doesn't mean that it's going to be an equitable place because it's like, 
there's a the, the, some and uh, unfortunately it's more the, the system is such as like patriarchal so especially white women who are very successful probably are good at playing the that game so and they might even be more hostile towards you because now, now you're breaking into their space right you're like now you're another woman it could be might not be it's just like there's no guarantee for that and also like the thing that i'm struggling with the most is that sometimes i'm not sure did i get that feedback because i'm a woman because i'm a woman of color or is it actually because of what i did you know sometimes it's just that's something that probably will be part of my career forever um in terms of advice so what i'm looking for in a job is always can my direct manager be trusted i've been in a lot of different organizations and like bigger ones smaller ones um and you know sometimes the overall culture sounds really great. Like I was in a company where, you know, I felt super great in the company. Um, I had a place and the, the, the people that I worked with were great, but my manager was just total spineless. You know, he just never did anything for me. He never spoke up for me. So while everything else was great, I was so unhappy and was close to actually burned out because I just couldn't trust my manager to help me with my work. Um, I worked in other companies where pretty much everything around me was burning, but because my team and my manager were so great and I felt so safe, just developing myself and not having to deal with all the shit that was going around, around me, um, I felt pretty good there. So yeah, that's probably what I would look for first. And then the other thing is like really know your worth, you know, know that you have, know the power that you're holding because people will make you feel like you don't have any power or they, you know, like in these kind of situations, they probably will deny you your um, skills and abilities just to talk you down. So you're more dependent on them. Um, so that's something that I learned quite late, actually, is to really understand the power that I have and how to utilize and how to use it and ask for more money and, you know, ask for more perks. Um, yeah, if you should start early with that, I think it's going to be really helpful for your career. Thank you. One minute? Okay. I'm glad to have this conversation later, and also I'm going to go to the lunch, to the women non-binary lunch, so I'm happy to have the conversation there as well. Right. Yeah, thank you so, so much for coming and all the questions.